Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session on accelerating HPC and chip design with AMD. My name is Wyatt Gorman. I'm the High Performance Computing Solutions Manager at Google Cloud. With me today, I have Rajiv Malhotra, who is the Senior Director of IT Infrastructure at AMD. Today, we have a great session for you. We have three agenda items. First, we're going to cover an overview of high performance computing on Google Cloud, what our mission for high performance computing is, and what our HPC solution platform looks like. Then we're going to focus on the AMD VM families and how they can accelerate HPC workloads. And finally, we're going to turn it over to Rajiv from AMD to discuss how AMD is accelerating their chip design processes on Google Cloud. So let's dive into what Google's mission and strategy around high performance computing is and what our HPC solutions platform looks like. So the HPC team at Google has a really clear mission, and that is to democratize high performance computing and make it universally accessible and useful. That's a pretty lofty goal, and at Google we call that a moonshot. But I want to explain today how we're going about uh, implementing that, what the components that we're building and improving are, and how we're accelerating HPC workloads today. There are two main areas that the HPC ecosystem has that we've been focused on improving over the last few years. And those are software, the software that HPC users use today, and the infrastructure that that software needs to run on. Looking at software, we know that HPC users are looking for the software that they rely on to be able to harness Google Cloud and cloud infrastructure natively, whether that's job schedulers, storage, or the applications themselves. Customers need their software to not only be able to run on cloud resources, but also be able to make use of those newest instance types or storage options and to reach extreme scales quickly. We meet customers where they are by partnering closely with the major schedulers, storage providers, and application vendors, as well as open source projects and so on, to be able to support them on Google Cloud so that they can build the best integrated and most capable compatible solutions for their customers. In infrastructure, we recognize that customers come to the cloud to get access to a newer, faster, more affordable, and more scalable set of computing resources than they could on-premise. We're happy to offer the latest and greatest in CPU platforms like the C2D, which we'll talk about in much more detail, as well as things like GPU platforms to help our customers accelerate their HPC workloads and reduce total time to, uh, to results or total cost. We're also proud that often we are the first in the cloud to offer a given hardware option. And we're able to do this thanks to our longstanding partnerships with hardware vendors and close collaboration with them around the design and performance of systems to ensure that they're working optimally in Google Cloud. We'll discuss much more about our HPC infrastructure and how our partnership with AMD in particular is broadening our HPC solution portfolio for HPC users and accelerating their workloads. But first, let's look at an example of someone who's using Google Cloud's HPC platform today. A great example of some of the recent work that our customers have accomplished by leveraging Google Cloud's HPC solution comes from Harvard. A team there built a new open source virtual drug screening platform called Virtual Flow. And in February of 2020, they had built a chemical library of 1.4 billion chemical compounds. And they were ready to begin using Virtual Flow to tackle problems like finding the next aspirin. However, by then, as we all know, COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes it was on the verge of becoming a pandemic. So as soon as they were able, they pivoted to screening their full chemical compound library of 1.4 billion compounds against 17 target SARS-CoV-2 proteins covering 40 target sites. They were able to do this over a period of five days using 80,000 vCPUs for a total of 75 million CPU hours of computational time. So what's the outcome been? Well, just earlier this year, they published a paper detailing their research and they published an interactive website where researchers can explore the 1,000 most promising compounds from each screen and start testing in the lab any ones that they choose. We're very happy to support the team through this work because we think it's so impactful, both, both in the immediate research that they did, but also in the impact that the virtual flow tool can have in the future. It turns out that the HPC community also thought that this work was very impactful, and they saw fit to award Google and the Harvard team the 2020 HPC Wire Reader's Choice Award for the best use of HPC in the cloud. So congratulations to the team, and we can't wait to see what else you can accomplish. So what are the HPC solutions uh, that our customers like Harvard have available to them? Let's take a look at our HPC platform. You can see we have the platform broken down into three layers. 
First is infrastructure, then development, then deployment. Let's take a look at some of the important components of each layer. In infrastructure, we have three key components to any HPC environment. That's compute, network, and storage. We have a wide variety of compute options available, including both CPUs, which we'll dive into more, in more depth in a minute, as well as GPUs, where we offer NVIDIA GPUs spanning generations from K80s through the latest and greatest A100s. We also offer TPUs for any intrepid researchers or ML practitioners, and you can expect to see support for TPUs in some of the software higher up the stack in the near future. In networking, you'll hear about how our new advanced networking enables VM throughputs of up to 100 gigabits per second, as well as things like placement policies, which dictate the placement of VMs relative to one another on our network. And most recently, the uh, 9K MTUs, which was just announced and is currently in preview, also sometimes called jumbo frames, which can significantly improve network performance. And in storage, we have a wide variety of options available from managed NFS at scale with file store to exascale object storage on Google Cloud Storage, to storage partner offerings ranging from NetApp to Dell EMC to DDN Exascaler for Lustre, which actually just took the spot as the top Lustre system on the latest IO500 benchmark list, which is like the top 500 list for storage systems. Moving up the stack, we have a number of new tools available to support customers developing on our platforms. We, of course, support the most popular infrastructure management tools like Terraform, Ansible, Packer, and so on. And there are tools that we build our customer integrations on and our partner integrations on. We also work hard to support both Intel MPI and OpenMPI. Looking at the tools that Google offers today, our HPC VM image can significantly improve the performance of HPC jobs. And I'll share how that is in a moment. We're also working on a set of HPC tools to simplify the development and deployment and integration of the multiple components of any given HPC environment. These tools are in preview today, and you can expect to see those tools open sourced in the near future. And finally, we have development. That's where you can see we offer integrations with a wide variety of schedulers in order to support the tooling that customers use, rather than forcing them to refactor or replatform. That means that if a customer comes to us with a Slurm cluster or an IBM LSF cluster, we can help them bridge the gap and either support their on-premises HPC expanding into the cloud or help them shift their workload completely into the cloud. We also support a number of HPC platforms like Rescale and Nimbix for those customers who are looking for a truly simple to use solution that requires very little management. We also offer purpose-built tooling native to Google Cloud like the Life Sciences API, which is a bioinformatics pipelining tool specifically built for the purpose it's used for. And of course, we offer a full monitoring and logging suite called Operation Suite which automatically collects logs, utilization statistics, and so on, and allows real-time and historical review, as well as feeding things like right-sizing recommendations, which can help identify and correct over-provisioned or under-provisioned resources. Let's work our way back down the stack to dive into a few of the most important recent changes to our HPC platform and learn how they can accelerate HPC jobs today. First, I mentioned the HPC VM image. This is a CentOS-based uh, 7 image today, CentOS 7-based image today, and it has a number of tunings and optimizations built directly into the image. Some of these are adjustments to user limits, changes in network tunings, disabling the Linux firewall, as well as SC Linux, a uh, number of Intel MPI collective tunings, and a simple, easy way to disable Spectrum Meltdown patches if so desired. You can see some of the improvements that we saw relative to the vanilla CentOS 7 image on some common HPC applications like LSDyna, Fluent, Wharf, uh, using some of their sample benchmarks, most significant of which is the reduction of LSDyna and their three-car crash model to about three-quarters the time uh, of the vanilla CentOS image runtime. This comes prepackaged as an image that can be booted directly or as the basis for custom VM images. You can also use it to deploy in the marketplace for a truly simple click-to-deploy user experience, or if you prefer, we also have all the details of the individual tunings and steps taken to apply them on our website and we welcome you to apply them to your own images. The HPC VM image also is already integrated with a number of HPC partners as the base image. So for example, you don't have to do anything extra to deploy a Slurm cluster using the HPC VM image since it's already the default image that Slurm deploys. 
Confidential compute is another great improvement that we've released recently. So what is confidential compute? It's basically identical to a regular VM. Customers can run any workload that they usually run in VMs. And by clicking a single checkbox, they'll actually transform their VMs into confidential VMs. When they do that, all of the memory pages of the confidential VM are actually encrypted. So you may ask if they're encrypted, uh, how does the CPU process them? Well, the data is encrypted in memory and is decrypted only when it's fetched from memory to the CPU chip. The keys are generated in hardware on the CPU, and those keys are ephemeral, so they're not persisted anywhere and cannot be extracted from the CPU chip by anyone, including Google. Each VM has its memory encrypted by a unique key per VM. And finally, customers are able to protect their data end-to-end, -end, both in transit and at rest, as well as finally in use. In the networking space, placement policies are a new key feature that can reduce the internode latency that one sees in the cloud significantly. And that can be a key for many distributed HPC applications. Placement policy offers two policies, spread and compact. Spread policy is great for high availability, while compact is what most HPC users will focus on. Compact placement policies place the VMs in that placement policy in the same logical infrastructure, which lowers the latency between VMs and improves network performance. Compact placement is supported on C2 VMs today, and you can request over 100 instances in a single compact placement policy. Of course, placement policies are also supported in many of our HPC partner software, including IBM LSF, as well as Slurm. One note is that the instances in a placement policy also have to be placed within the same zone. That's, however, no problem, thanks to our next update. So that update is the Compute Engine's new bulk API. So we actually built bulk API to simplify and speed up the process of deploying large scale clusters for our customers. Bulk API is a native API built into Compute Engine that allows you to take the same definition that was used previously to deploy a single VM, including all of the existing features in Compute Engine, and simply say that you want any number of those VMs up to a thousand. That instance creation call then takes the burden off whatever software was handling the cloud provisioning and hands it to the Google Cloud Platform, which reduces API calls and improves efficiency dramatically. Not only is the improvement uh, seen in the performance of deploying those VMs, but there's also the option of performing a new thing called regional capacity finding. So regional capacity finding enables the user to specify a region that they want the VMs launched in rather than specifying a specific zone within a region as is traditional with the compute engine calls. That opens up possibilities in terms of what zones your VMs can be created in and allows the bulk API to find all of the requested capacity within a single region in much less time. These two benefits of bulk API combined results in us seeing around a 500% improvement in large scale instance creation time versus the previous methods of batching HTTP calls and, and other things. And like placement policies and the HPC VM images, Bulk API has support from our HPC partners already, including IBM's LSF and Slurm. And finally, back at the bottom layer of our HPC platform are our compute offerings. We have a number of VM family options, all built and tuned for spe very specific purposes. They range from our cost-optimized E2 family through our massive 16 GPU A2 VM family for the high-end ML and GPU-enabled HPC applications. I want to focus on three of these families that are AMD-enabled and that can help accelerate HPC workloads. These are the balanced general-purpose N2D family in blue with a wide feature set, the scale-out workload-focused T2D family in yellow, and the compute-optimized C2D family on the left in red with very high clock speeds, which is perfect for HPC workloads like electronics design automation. So let's dive into the AMD families and see how they can accelerate HPC workloads. Looking at the N2D VM family, these instances are powered by our AMD Epic second generation processors and will support third generation processors in the future. This is in preview today. Let us know if you're interested in testing that. Each VM offers up to 224 vCPUs and 896 gigabytes of memory. 
And these instances also support a wide variety of features, including the newest advanced networking, which supports up to 100 gigabits of throughput on the larger VMs and up to nine terabytes of local SSD for customers looking for high performance local scratch space or to host a file storage server. On the right side, you can see some of the benchmarks that we've published relative to the general purpose N1 VM family. So the N2D is a really good choice for HPC applications that are memory bandwidth limited compared to the equivalent Intel based N2D VM family, though they are not as high clock speed as the C2 family. We've found that workloads like rendering can have the best price performance ratio on N2D. Looking at the T2D VM family, these instances are powered by our AMD Epic third generation processors. T2Ds are built for scale out workloads. So each VM offers only 60 vCPUs and 240 gigabytes of memory, but without advanced features support like advanced networking or local SSDs. Instead, T2Ds are optimized for price performance. They support things like GKE support at launch to provide access to our containerized HPC users. And they offer things like efficient persistent disk tiers for the best price performance disk possible. T2Ds also offer a 42% better price performance when compared against other leading cloud providers and other CPU platforms. So they make a really great fit for your scale out focused HPC workloads like financial simulations, for example. And finally, we have the C2D VM family, which is currently in preview. These instances are powered by our AMD Epic third generation processors, and each VM offers up to 112 vCPUs and 896 gigabytes of memory. These instances offer key HPC features like the advanced networking for up to 100 gigabits per second of throughput on larger VM sizes and up to three terabytes of local SSD for performance local scratch storage. CPU platform itself has also been optimized for HPC applications. The 3.5 gigahertz maximum clock speed and full vNUMA transparency to the underlying NUMA topology allows compute bound applications to perform optimally. The high memory, high memory bandwidth of the AMD platform combined with the local SSD and advanced networking options means that memory and IO intensive workloads can see dramatic acceleration as well, and that the platform is flexible enough to meet everyone's needs. C2D VMs are going to be available soon, and we're excited to see how our customers will use them to accelerate their toughest computing challenges like electronics design or chip design. So now let's turn to Rajiv at AMD to hear about how they're working to use Google Cloud's full HPC platform to accelerate their chip design process. Thank you, Wyatt. Uh, my name is Rajiv Malhotra, and it's my pleasure to be here and talk about uh, how AMD uh, is leveraging the Google uh, Cloud Platform uh, for doing um, chip design. So when we look at the silicon design flow, you can break this down into uh, three kind of major sections. Uh, one of them is the front end, uh, then there is the back end, and then the production. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but I do want to point out that uh, currently, we have flows running on the Google uh, platform uh, in the front end, uh, basically design verification. And then in the back end, we are running physical verification and uh, power and timing analysis. So let's take a step back and, and look at the AMD cloud journey. When, when we were looking at the public cloud, uh, we set some business objectives. Um, and the, the key objective that we set for ourselves was that we wanted to have flexibility in our capacity. Uh, and the goal for the cloud was to really help us align the compute and storage capacity to meet the variable demand. So the challenge was that on-prem, the capacity is fixed. However, the demand is variable. Uh, and not only is the capacity fixed, the utilization is extremely high. Um, in addition, we can also have short-term demand surges and they can happen very quickly. Uh, we, we, and those demand surges have to be addressed um, for R&D to meet their deliverables. So typically a demand surge may be, you know, maybe tied somewhere closing, closer to tape out or there are some additional erratas or um, uh, some other fix we need to do in the design quickly 
uh, that leads to an unplanned surge. The traditional way to address this is to use internal prioritization of compute resources. However, that will inevitably lead to an impacting some other project. Uh, so by definition, a prioritization means that some project you know, will get a lower priority. So the strategy that we came up with was to partner with a public cloud provider, uh, in this case with uh, GCP. Um, and because we wanted to ramp up very quickly on the cloud, uh, we came up with the short-term uh, strategy and the longer-term strategy. The short-term strategy was really focused on those engineering EDA flows uh, that could be rapidly re-architected to run in a hybrid cloud. Um, and the long-term strategy was to focus on some of those additional flows that would uh, require a longer lead time to, to re-architect, but then we could run them in a multi-cloud environment. When we, when we looked at the, the public cloud um, from an IT infrastructure perspective to run EDA workloads, uh, we looked at, looked at three, uh, three main uh, challenges. Uh, we were pretty clear in our mind that we wanted to keep a consistent look and feel uh, for our users. And our users on-prem were used to uh, running their jobs using our job scheduler, which is LSF. Uh, however, we wanted to use Slurm um, on GCP uh, platform. So we worked with, uh, worked with GCP to come up with a connector that allowed us to connect LSF to Slurm on GCP. Uh, the users were able to submit their jobs to LSF, and then LSF would then communicate with uh, Slurm uh, to create the necessary VMs or, or other resources, and then run those jobs over there. This way, the users you know, had, you could use their job submission scripts that were really uh, built around LSF job submissions and they did not have to change, um, change their methods. Uh, this le led to you know, a faster acceptance of the cloud by the user community. The second challenge that we faced was in the storage space. Um, now, EDA flows use um, NFS or uh, network file storage as their, their method of uh, using um, storage, but um, so we worked very closely with some of the leading NSF uh, storage providers to, and partnered with them and GCP to come up with the solution, which included uh, both native storage and also virtual NSF storage on GCP. Uh, the other challenge that we faced on storage was with file caching. Um, file caching was necessary so we could optimize the time um, when we run, when we burst uh, jobs onto the cloud, the data is still on-prem. So file caching was a mechanism to optimize access for those jobs from for data that was on-prem. And the third challenge that we faced was, uh, you know, how do we look at the results on the cloud? So we had to enable access for uh, our on-prem users, but we also wanted to run all of the post-processing jobs um, on the cloud itself to minimize any egress cost and just limit the data to, uh, you know, to something of a summary. So in the case, if it's a regression job, you know, it could be like a summary of the past failed results uh, rather than the dump of all the log files. There, there are some unique strategies that um, are needed for EDA workloads. And, and when we, when we are running on the cloud, uh, and in this case on GCP, we, we had to look at some of the unique compute instances that were required. Now these compute instances are those that are optimized for EDA workload. So we had to identify what those instances were. Uh, we ended up using N2D, which is a Rome based platform and it was generally available on Google. And we are also currently uh, looking at C2D, which is the Milan-based platform, and it's in preview uh, by, by Google currently. 
the, what we look for when we talk about optimization is the memory per core, uh, and we look at the total memory per server. And in addition to that, we also look at the operating frequency. All of them have an impact on the EDA workloads that we run in, in slightly different ways. In order to support burst computing, um, which is for peak demand, um, the, as we spoke about, the data was on-prem. And the strategy that we came up with is that, you know, we wanted to minimize any data transfer and egress cost. Um, I spoke about the egress cost in the previous slide. Um, for actual data transfer, what we wanted to do is to transfer large data sets that can then be leveraged for either very long runs or for a lot of multiple small runs. So those are the data sets where we, the time spent in transferring the data was a you know, very small fraction of the, the total runtime of uh, the set of jobs that we were planning to run on Google Cloud. We also uh, discovered very quickly that running just peak demand workloads was not the most efficient way to use the resources that were available to us on the cloud. So we came up with a strategy to um, run some sustained computing um, for steady state demand. Uh, the, the strategy we used, since some of these workloads were not um, you know, tailored to run in the cloud, we used a, a lift and shift methodology. So we took the, the, all of the flow plus all of the dependent data and moved everything to the cloud. So the complete project was then hosted on the cloud and we were able to run the, all of the jobs related to that project on the cloud as well as we were able to post process and you know, view the results on the cloud. So there was no data transfer happening between on-prem and the cloud. So, so I covered most of some of the uh, key uh, highlights of uh, the challenges we faced and some of the strategies and solutions that we came up with. Uh, in this slide, um, in conclusion, I wanted to talk a little bit about where we are today, uh, you know, what are, where we're going and where we expect to end up in this. So just a broad overview of our longer term plans. So if we look at where we are today, uh, you know, we did an IT transformation, we did cloud bursting, and we are able to run in burst mode uh, a limited number of flows. And that those flows are in production. We use this today for doing our tape outs. We run these burst uh, mode flows today. Um, I labeled it as limited because we are still expanding the footprint of the burst flows um, as we discover more about the cloud and discover, frankly, more about our own EDF flows. What we have in development and we expect to um, get the first release of that next year is the ability to do a full you know, chip design on the cloud. Uh, this is to address both the agility and the, and the time to market. Um, the, um, these flows are being re-architected. They are in development and we expect to release a lot of that um, probably in the next six to, six to nine months. We, uh, there's also, uh, we looked at cloud native licensing. Um, cloud native li licenses is also important in the long run for some companies that are interested in uh, not only getting all of the cloud resources, but also getting the EDL license resources available on the cloud. The, the last stage I wanted to talk about is really something that would eventually differentiate um, where uh, running on the cloud versus say running on on-prem. And that is to use some of the native um, AI and ML technologies that, uh, that GCP has available on the cloud. Um, we want to be able to, uh, you know, in concept, we want to be able to look at uh, flows like design verification, floor planning, and even timing closure, and look at some uh, machine learning type concepts to see how we can converge faster uh, on our designs. In addition, uh, we also want to look at AI-based technologies for yield optimization and for uh, detection of anomalies or, or defects. So this is something that's still in the concept um, phase, but it, it's something we have to look at as an, you know, an add-on that we can get from the cloud. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to conclude uh, this presentation.
Um, I also, I hope you guys enjoyed it and it gave you some insight into how AMD is using GCP. And I wanted to also take the time to thank, thank Wyatt uh, for giving me this opportunity to present here. Thank you.